For those of you who are not from around here, welcome to Verizon FCAD, the Faculty of Communication Design. Um, some of you are my students on the creative process, and some of you are other people who've come along, so we're very pleased to welcome all of you. Um, I'm David Gauntler, I'm a professor here. I'm very honoured and pleased. That's a strange. He's with you. are Good, thank you. Um, I'm very honoured and pleased to be able to introduce Bobby Burgers, who has come all this way from Vancouver to be with us today. That is very exciting. I sent him an email about six months ago or something saying, would there be any chance that Bobby Burgess might be able to come and visit us? And she's here for Art Toronto. She's not just here for us. Um, but she has come here for us. She's come here today. She didn't have to come today. Um, and she's here for Art Toronto. And now in its 20th year, the uh, major art and design festival of Toronto. Um, I'm going to say a couple of introductory things, but I'm not going to read out a whole biography because I hate it when people do that because it just goes on and on. And she's going to show us lots of beautiful things anyway. But Bobby was born in Vancouver, where she still lives and works. Uh, studied art history, not actual the practice of doing it. We'll talk about that perhaps, or perhaps you'll tell us about that. Uh, at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. Um, her work has been exhibited widely internationally, as in many collections. Um, she's well known for her use of colour, thick use of paint, and flowers. But we'll be seeing all of that and more, I'm sure. Um, so Bobby, I'll let you take it away. Bobby's going to talk for what may or may not be 40 minutes or something like that. Uh, then I wrote down some questions I wanted to ask her. You should also be thinking of questions you want to ask Bobby whilst she's doing her talking. That's my advice to you. Think of a good question. And then we'll have a whole field of delightful questions that we can also ask Bobby. Uh, then you can eat the colourful macaroons at the end. Or some of you already started, which is fine. Okay. Um, so thank you, Bobby. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for coming. It's nice to see all these young faces and new faces. I don't know how many of you know anything about me to begin with, but um, I've been given the heavy task of talking about the creative process and what is creativity, which I think is kind of a big daunting subject because it's so varied. Um, I'll give a little brief description of myself and then maybe I can talk a little bit about my creative process and maybe that gives you some insight into um, the overall picture of creativity. So I grew up in West Vancouver. My parents uh, are immigrants from Holland and they were architects and are still practicing. Uh, so a very creative household with um, no television and no electronics, a lot of building materials from houses and a lot of paints and pastels and things like that. And it was a different time, obviously. Um, it's, it's pretty hard to avoid uh, electronics now or, and computers and all these wonderful new inventions, but I did grow up in a bit of a bubble. So I spent a lot of time drawing and um, playing on my own. It's a kind of a lonely childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. But um, then I went on to university and I studied in France for a while. I studied at University of Victoria. I started off in the fine arts program and after the first year I was getting frustrated with um, the direction of the professors, which in hindsight I find is probably pretty self-centered and maybe a little bit pompous of me because I was 19 or 18 and um, I really didn't know what I was doing. But anyways, I broke free and I decided to paint on my own and study art history. So I did that and I had my first exhibit when I was 19 and had my first big um, exhibition in a well-known gallery in Vancouver when I was 22 or 23 or something and I've been painting ever since. So this has been my entire life and I have not really had another job. Uh, so. It's kind of an interesting experience, and a lot of people can't really relate to what I do. Um, and it's very hard to sum up in a quick statement. Like one of the moms at hockey the other day said, so what do you do? I hear you're an artist. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. But I can't, I can't sum it all up. It's too big and it sounds silly when I say, yeah, I paint flowers. So I just kind of stay quiet and hopefully they figure it out on their own. Maybe the bigger picture of what I do probably very bored of this picture. Um, 
I don't really plan things out that well. I kind of talk like I paint, so I have some rough ideas, but hopefully it makes sense in the end. Uh, I think I started with this picture because I wanted to show some of my earlier work and explain how it's evolved and what my creative process has been um, over the last 25 years. Um, so I have lots of children, I have four, and this is some random photo from a magazine a long time ago, and I thought I would just show, because this is one of the first paintings I created where um, I had let go of a lot of the traditional aspects of a still life or a floral painting. And when I first started painting, I didn't understand how I could, how I could break free of the traditional mold. And through repetition over many, many, many years, I slowly let go of certain things. And I started to see that um, a still life is not still at all. It's, it's, a, it's a mixture of the past and the present and the future. And that a lot of things happen during the creation of one piece of artwork. So light changes, flowers fade, they completely change shape, they wilt, they move, they grow, the tulips grow quite a bit, and light reflects around it, and then there's also the human emotion that's interjected in there um, that adds in layers of, of feelings. And I, I didn't want the still lives to be on a table anymore or just about a few falling petals. I really wanted them to be about movement, metamorphosis, um, decay, kind of like a windy, stormy, uh, slightly rebellious version of a still life. It's one of the things that always bothered me about the notion of flowers, that they're considered sort of feminine or docile, and I wanted to take this genre and add a new layer onto it, showing that they can be strong and willful because they are in nature, and, um, and they can break through anything from cement, and they can come back year after year, and they have this incredible fortitude, and I started to think of them more as um, a symbol of feminine strength and not of um, docile domestic domesticity. So I, I started to break away, but I didn't know how to do that. And that's one of the things about creativity that I find is an interesting hurdle. Um, there's nothing that you can do but put in hours to get through um, ups and downs and forge your own path. And that can be the most painful and heart-wrenching experience. I've been through that many years. You know, every cycle of maybe three or four years, I go into a really big slump and I feel quite destitute. And it's an actual deeply felt emotion where I feel distraught, I don't know what to do. Um, I feel like my work is worthless. And it seems to get worse, funnily, as my career goes better and better, uh, which I think is kind of cruel. I get more critical of my work and um, the highs and lows become bigger and bigger. So that was a little sidetrack. Um, what I was gonna say was that I didn't know how to handle breaking free. And I remember my father, the architect, he was sitting there once in my studio and he was saying, well, why do you always have to have it in a boss? Like, well, where is it going to come from if it's not in a vase? Like, what, it's going to just be floating, like, in the air or, like, flopped on a table? What's going to happen? And so this process began for me of how to break it down. So I started to layer in what it looks like at one moment, another moment. And they came sort of, I was using a lot of crystal vases at the time, and light was reflecting. And I kind of layered it up, and they became shards of light and shards of, uh, they were vague representations of, of crystal vases. And then eventually, pretty quickly, I let go of the vases altogether, I let go of the green stems, and they became more about tumbling motion. And I liken them a lot now to more like human flesh, and I feel like there's a lot of persona in flowers, um, and, and personality, and, and how when you first buy a bunch of tulips or pink flowers, everything
everything looks very um, uniform and proper and clean, like a lot of you do. Youth has its gorgeous uniformity, and then as we grow older, we get all our funny, um, you know, styles and ticks and whatever we do when we grow older, like we become, you know, more differentiated from each other. So I, I did this parallel between flowers and humans, and I just thought that was a really interesting way to, to show the evolution of time and, and accepting one's journey and thinking this is a good thing and not necessarily a bad thing. So I, again, I, I was just showing a couple of shots. This is an older piece at my house, and I included it because I think somewhere in there, you might be able to see the layered vases in the background um, that aren't really clear. There's two or three of them in there together. Um, and another kind of example, and, and at this time my work was very poppy and sunny, and there is, you know, I, I, I love doing it, but um, we all change and we evolve, and I, I wanted to eventually speak a different language, um, which, you know, is, is I like seeing an artist's journey as is a, a series of events, and when we buy art or we are interested in somebody's career, it's not just a, something pretty to hang on the wall, but it's part of somebody's artistic journey and their process, and um, and it's part of a lifelong thing, and you have to sort of read it as an entire book. You can't just take a little chapter out of it and say, well, this is, this is the part that interests me. It is really about understanding the whole picture. So anyways, this is my backyard, and I think I included it in because these, growing a lot of my own flowers has been a really hand-on experience for me, and a, um, I just sold my orchard, but I used to you know, spend most of my year tending to my orchard, and um, I, I think this is part of my creative process, is the planting, the seeing things come to life, and then the eventual decay, the chopping back, and the grief refueling the soil in the, in the spring again and, and watching the seasons go by. It's, it's a super exciting process for me. If you've ever grown anything yourselves, it's, it's quite exhilarating and I find huge comfort in seeing the seasons go. So those are Japanese anemones and this is an earlier version painting of that. I don't know, this is maybe four or five years old. And this is where I was starting to bring in that sense of movement and as you can see there's not a lot of um, uh, sense of place it's more about a, a feeling so old studio uh, daughters picking I'll, I'll leave it on there for a minute um, <coughs> what should I talk about next uh, I think creativity is something that I would like to for myself as exercising a muscle. Um, I, I get very restless and nervous and anxious if I haven't done something creative during the day. And it can be as simple as helping my kids with a project or helping somebody else or even making a card to what I normally do, which is draw or paint for several hours. And, I find it's just, um, I get a lot of pent up energy and I get anxious uh, if I don't let it out. And, and I think that we were talking earlier about that, that making that rhythm, like, you know, like when you start to go for runs or something like that and you think this is just terrible, but it feels satisfying at the end. That's what I, I kind of like in creating too. Uh, and the more we do it, the more I do it, the more you want to do it, and and it's a pretty huge part of my life. I, I even when I go on vacations that aren't meant to be artistic experiences, I still find myself drawing and experimenting. Um, so I don't know how you all feel about that. Maybe you can tell me later on. But I do think that a regular practice is uh, whether it's writing or dancing or whatever creative outlet um, is pretty essential to exercise it on a regular basis. One of the things when I was thinking about creativity that
kind of irks me is when somebody says to me, and this is a, like a, maybe not that funny, but it seemed really funny to me or annoying at the time, when um, a businessman friend of mine said, I was saying, he was saying, how's, the, how's it going today? And this is a couple of years ago, and I was like, it's actually really terrible. Like, it's, I feel distraught, and it's, I'm not understanding what I'm doing, and I, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I can totally relate. relate. Like, my business is so creative, too. And I, um, and he makes business deals and brings together companies. And I understand that the word creativity is a very broad one. And it can't really be fun, and I don't think we can only use it towards artistic pursuits. But I do think that um, creating something out of nothing is challenging, and it's it's more challenging than taking pieces and putting them together and making deals, and um, and it it does take a lot of pushing through and. Uh, I find at least. I mean, maybe some people have it easier than me, but I don't mean to sound like I suffer that much. But I, I, I do wonder the the act of carving out something that is a wholly unique voice for yourself is um, is a challenging one, and it and it doesn't happen overnight. And you can't jump in halfway. You just have to put in the hours. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure everybody's seen different parts of, of, of your, even your university career is that you might be seeing people imitating your work or jumping on, on your ideas. And um, I think that's the biggest cheat for everybody around because you're cheating yourself of that authentic process and all those highs and lows. And, um, and also it's just not that fair. Um, so then I was gonna talk about my, my process a little bit. I started drawing more uh, a few years ago and found it very satisfying. There's you know, different textures and there's, there's, funnily enough, drawing is, feels more free and less um, obligated in a way compared to painting, but at the same time, it's actually way more complicated because it's such a delicate process and it has to be framed, it has to be shipped, and, and so it's really this double thing, but it, it feels when you're doing it to be a very quick and instinctual thing. And when I started drawing again, not that this painting really relates, um, when I started drawing more again, I opened up like a whole different world that has opened up then another galaxy and another galaxy. And I, I love that about um, the creative process is that once you let yourself go in one direction, you can open up another one quickly afterwards. And so by drawing, I started <coughs> simply like you saw in this last, which is just charcoal on paper. It's quite large scale. But I moved on to, um, this is an example of kind of a weird new thing. Um, where I started then using oil on, on drawings and making them more three-dimensional and oil bars and different materials. And that quickly moved on to collaging and making three-dimensional drawings. And then that opened up another door and another door. And it's, it can't tell you how, how much fun it is when you have those, because I find myself all day in my studio essentially and like I sometimes have an assistant come in, but very rarely, and so when you're when you're having so much fun by yourself, it's actually quite exhilarating. And so I I, I wanted to take drawing to a different level, which um, had been, maybe been quite as explored yet. And because my painting is so textural, I thought maybe there's a way I could bring that to drawing. So I would use lots of different mediums and um, pile them up. So that lasted for about a year, and then I went on to, uh, where was that finished product of that one? And from there, I went back to drawing again, but then I started collaging them together. And, oh, there's another one. Oh, there one. Um, but this has just been a really interesting process, which you might see later on in the, in the uh, slides, of seeing how far I could push a medium and a material 
And I know sometimes at school, because one of my daughters is Emily Carr right now, she was saying the other day that she was getting lots of rules about material, lots of, you know, we can't breathe in the chocolate dust. I hope nobody ever comes to my studio because I think there's like a, I think I'm probably going to not live that long, but there's, you know, spray paints and chocolate dust and pure pigments and I like to make a giant mess and my studio is huge so hopefully there's enough air ventilation, but I like the the idea that my ignorance, in, to some degree, doesn't hinder my experimentation. I feel like if you know too much about something, maybe you have follow too many rules, and I like, you know, I kind of like that in-between area, especially when I work with ceramics or different materials that I really have no expertise in. Um, and then somebody can just come and say, you know what, I don't know if that's gonna work for me. I'm like, well, just try it, and if it explodes in the kiln, it explodes. If it falls apart, it falls apart. Um, but I think it's opened up a lot of doors for me by playing in that way and creating in, in a way where I don't know what the rules are. And that's what happens when you have no rules training, I <laughs> think. Um, so I brought up this slide, I think, because around the same time where I was disintegrating everything, I was asked to do a commission, and the woman that asked me, um, uh, owns a very famous furniture design store in, in Vancouver, and she had seen this detail that I posted on Instagram or whatever, and it was an interesting jumping off part because she said, I'd like to have a painting that feels like that. So, and I was so excited because I've always wanted to do that, but I don't know why I had never done that before. And I um, took this challenge and started creating works like this, which ended up in um, this apartment. And I, I was so excited, sometimes, not very often, but somebody's little tiny input can shoot you off in a new direction. And although I don't collaborate with anybody normally, I love having those discussions. And there was no guidelines. She just said, I like the freedom of this detail. And that opened up like two years of working around in, in, in this aura where it was recognizable but not 100% anymore. Um, as you saw earlier, even though I was being, I thought, free in works like this, everything was still quite representational. And I mean, they, they seem like huge leaps for me. Maybe they don't look like it from afar, but it was pretty exciting at the time. And it's those breakthroughs where you have this energy that you can just keep on going for hours. And uh, so I guess my point on that is that allowing people to jump in and suggest, but not necessarily having to, um, you know, recreate their vision is actually kind of helpful sometimes. Uh, okay. Well, one of the other things that I want to talk about was the uh, act of creativity and um, the act of painting. And because some people in the past have said painting is sort of a dead art form, and it's definitely had a resurgence in the last few years. And um, along with that, people ask, well, you know, why do you include the drips and the, the mistake kind of looking areas. And I've thought a lot about that. It was, it was a, an instinctual thing at first, but I think what I, when I really sat down and thought, well, how do I answer that question? Um, it was more about the fact that painting is a very intuitive process, at least my style of painting, and I don't have a lot of preconceived notions, and that it's also one of the last forms of art that's not really replicable. I know that they're talking about doing 3D printing of paintings that can look exactly like that. Yeah. That's just a replication, but as an art form, it's not like a photo or something that you can do series of. It is a one-off process. And that really excites me in a world where there is so much consumption to have something that that nobody else has, and you, there's just one version in the world of that. And so I wanted to really include 
the painterly process in my work and uh, include the mistakes as well as the intentional marks. By starting with that, I actually moved more into um, letting paint do its own thing and then I would react to it. So this, this kind of work, you know, there was washes and so forth in it, but over time I would lay um, the canvas down. Let's see what's going on next. You might be able to see it a little bit in something like that. This is still earlier on. Um, but I would lay the, the canvas down and move around inks and different viscosities and paints and different um, like thinness, thickness, washes, and and they would move over the canvas on their own and create these, uh, you know, pools and tides and, and really concentrate in certain areas and not, and it would give me a basis that I could react to in a way that I kind of liken to a chess game where the paint does something and then I'll do something and, and it makes it actually quite fun with the conversation even though it's only with paint, but I like to, to lay it down and wait, you know, an hour or two and move over to something else and then see what's happening on there and then I can react to it. So it's not all pre-formulated in my mind. Uh, it's, it's more about a conversation with <coughs> different paints and mediums. Then, um, I think I want you to talk about, there's more studio shots, and my palette. And there's, oh, that one. Oh, this is, um, I think this was, I was gonna touch on this sculpture, a little wall hanging that's at the Simon store in Vancouver, because I thought it was an interesting process for myself. When they first come to ask, they, they, I assumed they were gonna ask for like a big painting. And I happened to have these experimental pieces lying around my studio. And they said, no, we'd like to actually talk about doing something like this, but I had actually no idea what I was doing or how to even make something like that, or if I was, if it was capable, I had the, the technical skills. And, but I said, oh, that sounds, that sounds fantastic, which is a fun thing about taking on a project that you don't know anything about. Um, and so I was at my local pottery studio for about a year every week. I would make five or six um, module pieces for my sculpture. And at first, they were very realistic. And through the sheer repetitiveness, they moved from being, like my painting, from about, they moved from being representations of, of anemones to more about looking like a brush stroke and that fine line between a brush stroke and what a petal looks like. And there's a nice, easy connection actually because they, they really feed off each other those two things. It's not like um, different forms of, you know, representing um, things from reality. It's, it's they, they really feed off each other. It's quite easy to make a petal look like a brush stroke and a brush stroke to look like a petal. Um, quite easy. But, you can see the connection. And so it, I just love that just the, the sheer number, I think I made about 70 pieces. I think this shows about whatever, 15 or 20 of them. So there's about 70 in total and they got bigger and they got looser. And it was a real lesson to me about sticking with something and doing it over and over and over again until your true voice comes out. Because the last pieces I made, I liked and I was far more interested in than the first pieces. And if I was to do it again, I would do it completely differently. I would probably make it larger scale and I would make it focus solely on the movement of these, this kind of um, big sweeps and stay away from the more representational side of it. Really fun project. Um, and, so yeah, and that, that led into all sorts of other ceramic projects. I don't know where the next one's coming up. This area that I was talking about earlier where I was trying to disintegrate it. And, and so these marks, which, you know, maybe this is the <coughs> one foot by one foot area on the painting, 
have all exploded to a much bigger scale. So the drips have become bigger naturally because I'm using bigger brushes. So yeah, this, these, um, and the, it works like this. You can start to see more staining underneath uh, areas that are moving on their own that I incorporate or take out. One of the, the big tricks for me is, the biggest problem really is what to let go of and what to keep because you can't have it all. And sometimes there's really interesting areas and I'm sure this is in all sorts of design where you have to make sacrifices and um, Sometimes it takes me several days, sometimes several months to just say, you know, I love it, but I, I find comfort that I know that it's somewhere underneath there. <laughs> Nobody's gonna ever see it. And I just have to let it go and, and move on for the, the greater good of the composition. Um, oh, I was gonna bring this up as, as a, an example of how things can go wrong. In, in the process. I have been asked to create a, a brain for a research lab and I didn't want to follow any of their rules. They had given me a plastic or a fiberglass brain and I was supposed to paint it and I just thought actually that really sounds super tacky. I, don't know. I didn't know how to make it look interesting for myself. So I decided to kind of make the general shape of a brain out of ceramic. So this is about, you know, I don't know, this big, two, three feet across. And I, again, I didn't know what I was doing and in whatever, fixing them all together and making them stay. And I spent months doing it. I had it photographed very nicely in the studio where it came because I didn't want to transport it. I left it sitting there and then the next day I came back and it had fallen. And I couldn't believe it because I was do. You can see where all the nice stainless steel pins are that held it all together. And I just thought it was ridiculous. I, I, was, I didn't know how I was going to be able to do it again. And, um, and it was devastating because I quite liked it at that point. And I was quite happy with it. And then I played around with the idea that should I resin the whole floor there and just keep it where it is? Or, and, and then I, I kept it there for weeks on the floor, just as it was. And then I scooped it all up and it's still sitting now, like three years later in a bucket. And I, I'm sure I'll reuse it, but it was a good example that, you know, sometimes things don't work out and that's okay. And I worked very hard and I, over the next, I squished it in and I made a new one within um, only like a month's time instead of the six months it took me to make the first one. Because with ceramics, you, know, you have to make the piece, you have to let it dry for a certain amount of time, and you have to fire it and blaze it, and then you have to fix it together. So it was just a long process. It's not like painting, which you can, you know, do quickly if you use acrylics. Um, yeah, here's an here's an example of an underpainting where I'm I'm letting the different uh, types of paint because everything has its own, each brand has its own way of moving and. Uh, how much water, less water, and which style of acrylic you're using, and I, I love seeing that experimental um, part where it's moving around in its own way, and then letting nature do its thing. I was just including some older. So this is that same piece starting to transform, and pieces under in the way on way. These are still all a few years old. Um, I think I was including that because it's a, it's a close-up of a drawing and, and I love working with oil bars because they have so much texture and depth, although nobody seems to be making them anymore, so it might be, it might be the end of that fun, but um, this is sort of that idea of a drawing leaping off the page the same way that a, a painting can and, and um, having my, my own fingerprints and my own movement embedded in there. Uh, I think that's just really interesting to have a part of somebody's process and you're always going to you know, have that frozen in time. Um, so recently, let me see what's coming up next. 
So when I was doing these oil bar drawings, I, I was having a lot of fun with them, but over time I started cutting them up. I want you to find that, I don't know where it is. I started cutting them up because I wanted them to have um, a bit more of, of a juxtaposition, of the, uh, maybe an urbanity that, you know, that took away the sweetness and added a bit of uh, sour flavor or um, a bit of dirtiness to the whole subject matter. And I was starting to do that in my paintings more, but I hadn't really brought that over to the drawings. So by cutting them up and starting to use different materials, I felt like I could jostle the viewer out of their regular um, sense of what a floral could be. And by having materials juxtapose our colors that didn't make sense, whether it's India ink against oil or charcoal against spray paint, or colors that just looked incongruous, um, that it, it, it kind of brings the viewer out of this sweet reverie. And it's something I'm interested in exploring more and more. And, and with doing these kind of more sculptural, I wish I made better order in my slides, but I'll just go back and forth. Um, And to keep, you can't really even see it, but you know, along up here, there's 
below this line here, there's a very thin red charcoal along the edge of the paper, and it becomes almost like a sculpture, which then, of course, led into my other sculptures later on. Um, and this is a bigger example of that same kind of collage work. So this is about seven feet by six feet or so. And what interests me, again, is this, um, there's no hierarchy in what materials can be used um, and what they, you know, so I have very expensive oil bars, I have um, mixed with something as simple as charcoal and spray paint. And so you get these areas that are really rich and um, dense looking and then areas that are very light and flighty. And I just, I'm just, I just think it's a, 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 an area to be pushed is in drawing and I would like to do more and more of that. It's actually my biggest sort of passion right now. Am I sticking on the subject? Okay. All right. Um, my work became more monochromatic. I did a, a whole series of um, what people call my black and white works, whereas you can probably see that they're not quite black and white. Um, there was a lot of color, but I, at this point I was extremely interested in um, the passing of time. My father had passed away. He used to always bring me roses. For some reason, I had still some dried up, you know, bouquets laying around for reference. And they became this huge series, which I'm still working on today. Um, so they're a little bit more emotional, a little bit, you know, as I would say, they've changed quite a bit if you go back to the first slide from being poppy and optimistic to a bit more mournful and complex, I hope that is what they're saying at least. Um, this will be oh. So this is one of the topics I wanted to talk about. So I, I was given the task of filling a, a small community museum in the summer with an exhibition and it's very small and it's a heritage building and I wasn't super excited about it and I didn't want to have my usual gallery paintings in there. So I decided to wrap the interior of the building in one large drawing, which ended up being about 40 feet uh, long by nine feet tall. And this is, I think what I wanted to say about this was that I think people think that artists always know what they're doing or that I, if, if I've been doing this so long, I must have this idea. And literally, I had zero idea what I was doing or how this was going to end up. And I was super surprised how much I liked it at the end. But at this stage, I, I was, it was very late at night. This was an extra project. So this was my nighttime project. And I had, I had no idea if this was going to work out. And it could have been a massive disaster um, because it's in my hometown. And I think I'm known for a certain style of thing. And um, so I, but you know, I guess it's more about taking risks and, and letting things go. Um, I mean, you can all judge yourself if it worked out or not, but I, I definitely had a lot of fun doing it and, and having that much space to work on something. Um, so this is a corner of the building. It was too hard to get a photo of the entire thing, but it read kind of like a scroll around the, um, around the whole building and and it was just doing these <coughs> experimental fun things that don't necessarily have to be commercially successful or even relate to your bigger practice is has become more part of my um, and I'm finding those are the most successful things in the end where I'm not trying to really fit even my own form. I know that I'm losing a lot of people that liked my work along the way, collectors, but I feel like it's being weighed up by a different new audience and you can't please everybody. So I'm kind of excited about, about that. Um, yeah, I think this was another example of, I just wanted to show sort of the scale of brushes and being fearless. It was the project I just did for Nordstrom's in New York and it doesn't look that big, but in reality it was very intimidating. It's a 10 foot by 10 foot canvas, and um, there were a lot of new things for me in it that I was thinking on. Raw canvas instead of 
just so uh, the scale, how I was going to ship it. It was just a lot of challenges. And this is midway through the process. And working on it myself, like just the, the logistics of laying it down, standing it up, um, moving it around, building the structure. It's like I felt a little bit like a construction worker. And normally, you know, I just get everything delivered and I do a little bit of stretching, but whatever. It was a very exciting project. And um, another example of a collaboration with somebody else's small input and me being able to take that and run with it in a, in a very exciting way and not feeling stifled. So I hope with whatever creative process you guys do that you all feel that way. And there's the end, uh, the end product. And uh, I know I was saying before that you just have to work through things and solve, but I'm sure people feel this with writing or other creative mediums that sometimes actually, I mean, I've left it for several weeks in between the last photo and this photo, and I got over myself and got less attached, again, to some of the sensitive little areas that I'd worked really hard on and they became less important to me and I was able to just forge forth and and put on that last bit of energy without feeling all like, attached. Um, so with the collage drawings, I wanted to show this. This is another project that for me, I, 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 don't, I didn't even know what I was making and I spent a lot of time making something. I had no idea what I was making. I, I started with um, styrofoam shapes and thought I was gonna plaster it and then paint it. But in, in the end, it became something completely different. And this was also several weeks uh, in, I uh, no, several months in the making with long periods in between. And so I think that um, the lesson I learned from this is that the challenge with creating and creativity is that is taking it from whatever you have in your mind to uh, actually going through and following through with it. Otherwise, it's just all, you can't solve anything until, um, until you actually start working on it. And, and getting started is half the, the process, getting over that intimidation. This went from being dark blue, I don't have that middle photo, uh, back to being all white. So this is about halfway through, and then about two weeks later, it started to look like this, where I was layering on, and again, like, oh, am I gonna lose all those? Like, this is, you can't see it, it's, it's really big in reality, but this is board plaster that's dry into folds, which took forever, and I just wanna, I just wanna lose all that, but I had to sacrifice certain areas, and, and it goes along, and then, uh, in the end, it ended up looking like this. And although I thought nobody would be interested in it or even have any comments about it, it was just a purely selfish passion project for myself. I, um, in the end, this is what I want to pursue next. I find it um, <coughs> extremely exciting and uses all my faculties at the same time, and whether it's you know, building things, fixing things, learning about different materials, and a real playfulness that I enjoy, like being able to just play. And, and sometimes with subjects or, or projects that I don't have a history in, I feel like there's less obligation to, to conform. So that makes it kind of fun too. Um, nothing super interesting now. I was going to show you this funny project that I worked on, which is a woodblock that's uh, a wood carving that ended up being, they had to use a steamroller to print it because it was so big. And it was just another fun uh, process where I, I was working with people that knew what they were doing and helped me do some of the fine carving and for the rest of it, that's just pure experiment. Um, yeah, I think that might be it. Uh, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, I think the last thing about creativity that I wanted to say was I recently heard a comparison between Picasso and Matisse. And the, oh, no, no, Matisse. Um, say that. And 
I'm sure all of you know them to a certain degree, but I actually had never thought about it in this way, that Picasso apparently did hundreds of drawings before he'd start a big project, and he would have it all laid out and all organized, and then he would create the one final piece, say with Guernica or something like that. And the, the preparation was almost all the work, and then when he went to the canvas, it would be uh, all settled in his mind where everything was going to lay. Whereas with Cezanne, um, painting apples and oranges over and over and over again, I uh, think, you know, what was the point? And the idea with him was that he created while he was creating and on the canvas in real time. He didn't come in with um, sketches or concrete ideas. It was about experimenting while creating. And those are two completely different ways of thinking and are both very valid. And I found myself really relating to say that because that's how I work, as you can see, my messy process, where I'm you know, there's no sketches there, and it's just all happening in real time. Um, it, it just, it just struck me how, how true that was. I, I thought that was fascinating, and how I'd never thought of it that way before. And there are different people, like my brother, being the architect, who sketches and plans everything out, and can can make, you know, intricate drawings. And and then there's myself that just dives in and. We see what happens and those, when those two worlds collide. It's really interesting, um, and and they're both both processes that work. Uh, so as creativity goes, I thought that was a, a, an interesting way to sum it up. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> So that, <laughs> that was loads of really interesting stuff, so that's great. And now we can ply you for more interesting stuff as we can questions. So I wrote down some things, so you can be thinking about your things too. Um, I just want to say that some of the things that you, I don't know to what extent you already have them in your mind, but just things you seem to have almost just said along the way are like, great. Like the thing about the artist's journey being a series of events, and they're like chapters in a book, which means that you can't have, you can't take them separately. You need to take all of them as being part of the thing. That's very, that's amazing. It's a wonderful thought, though. Huh? Oh, well, know. yeah, I mean, I mean, I know a lot of artists, like, say, Gordon Smith or somebody, that um, he has gone through dark periods and and had, has had quite a varied career within his subject matter, moving from really abstract stuff in the, the 70s and then um, almost following, you know, different, different stages. And I think people can relate more to different sections, but you do have to see it as, as a career. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One thing is, this is easy, but you've got lots of great pictures, right? And that must be the result of, like, obviously you take pictures of works, and that is the thing yeah. you would do. But also you've got process pictures where we can see you doing it, and obviously you aren't taking those photos, because yeah. somebody else has taken the photos. So you make some effort to get illustrations oh, of the work in process. Yeah, I mean, well, every time I do a catalog or have an exhibit, they always ask for like a studio shot or right. something, and, or we're making a book right now, but I, I luckily my sister-in-law is a professional photographer, right. and she's actually very, she's gotten, she's kind of been doing it about as long as I did, so I feel very comfortable with her, so once and every few months I'll get her to come over and take some photos. Oh, yeah. very good. It works. Um, one thing is, and you guys over there might have an interest in this. My question is, how did you get noticed? And things were different then. You didn't have Instagram and stuff. Yeah. But how did you get noticed at the start? And do you still make efforts to be noticed or do you just let it happen? My biggest problem has been rebranding myself. Uh, when you've had a career as long as I have and in a, a world that is, is nuanced and complex and fad oriented and, and kind of a little snooty like the art world, to re be able to rebrand yourself at my age has been my biggest challenge. Because, because I didn't go to art school, I, I spent my first 15 years literally teaching myself how to control paint and how to move paint and really finding a path for myself. But I created an audience and I got known for this. And so then I had to kind of 
back out of that um, in all sorts of ways, like physically from retreating from galleries I've been with for many years and taking time off from not painting but from exhibiting uh, and letting go of what was very lucrative and successful and saying, oh, you know, I, I have to, I'll, I'm going to shrivel up if I don't do this. <coughs> Slowly it's piecing itself back together in a different way and I think my work's being seen in a different way, but that's the biggest challenge. But how did I get noticed at first? Um, having a small exhibit at a community gallery. And, you know, I, I don't know, I mean, I guess my subject matter was pretty palatable and um, you know, but there was no website, so things were more complicated. You couldn't take easy photos. Uh, there was no websites. Yeah. So, um, but having a little bit of money, just um, that little starter money, <coughs> allowed me to buy more supplies, and then I would create more and more, and like it, it just was a tumbling effect. Like I would just put everything back into being able to support my little passion on the side. Ah, well, I really like how you said how as it became more experimental you find that you know you could be falling back on what people are expecting you to do but as you get more exper experimental that breeds new success because people find yeah. new things to engage with. Yeah, it's just a different audience. Yeah. Yeah, That's I mean I still get people saying, hey, can you paint something like <laughs> you did in, you know, 2012 or 2010 and, and like I physically don't actually know how to do that anymore so that's kind of a funny scenario. I'm like, I'd like to for you, but I don't know how to. Okay. Go back no. I got one last question, then we've known it up. Um, we did a what we did a thing called the, uh, free school here in the summer, where we just did lots of nice creativity classes, and it was all lots of fun. And in one of them, for some reason, I found um, we we looked at this artist statement because I thought it was a really nice statement of somebody who sort of started off doing a thing, and after like 20 years, had realised that actually he was doing it for a whole different reason. It was about self transformation. So, um, and then I made this kind of worksheet for people to do for creating your own artist statement. An artist statement sounds like a kind of clunky kind of thing that most artists hate doing. But I made it really easy by having you just insert words on this sheet. And at the end, it had this bit, which, and I like this bit. This bit said, um, I started doing whatever, I started doing it because, mm -hmm, but now I feel, mm -hmm. and if you had to do that, you started doing all this because, what? But now you feel what? That's putting you on the spot, isn't it? Normally you get a few moments to think about it. Oh, I... But let's take it step by step. You think you basically started out on this whole journey because what? Well, I really, I, I like playing around with color. Uh -huh. Like color is my thing. I like playing. The flowers were a sub-product of that. I ha it was not like a you know, hugely botanical based person. So that doesn't really answer your question. No, that's I good started thing. doing that's it, it because I'm fascinated by colors. Yep. And now but I now find that I'm more fascinated by, I still enjoy colors, but now I'm more interested in the movement of paint itself, like the viscosity and the textures. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to push it further. So that's the, that's the sort of technical. <laughs> side in a way, that's the material side. But along the way you've also discovered something about yourself that gives you this drive to do it. Because you could have stopped at any point, couldn't you? But you yeah. could have been sort of playing with paint in your early twenties and then moved into a lucrative career in banking or something. But you didn't. Yes. You did this. Uh, and you carried on doing this. Why have you carried on doing this? I love that. Well, that's such a hard question. <laughs> I, it's, I that, that, that's a, it's that internal drive. Like I, I, it's, I feel kind of a little nauseous if I don't get it out. Uh -huh. I will make, carve out ridiculous, crazy times. Like I used to row for the national team and I was in a tiny apartment in whatever, London, Ontario, and I shared with a bunch of girls and I create my own little corner to paint in after everybody was in bed. I just, it's just something that nods at me and I need to get it out. It's, I, I, hey, it's self-preservation in a way, because you'd go crazy otherwise. Yeah, and, and you know, maybe I was a little shy when I was younger and it just I carved out this area for myself that defined me. Uh -huh. And uh, That's great. Yeah. Good answer. I did put you on the falling the I, I think it's like like human folds and wrinkles and, and flesh like appearances that's like no this doesn't look like a 
flesh necessarily. I'm more interested in that than than the color, but that's not totally true either. Like sometimes I'm just like I just want to paint a yellow paint and something that makes me happy and I let lay out sort of constraints. Like I did one it's not in the slideshow, but that I really wanted to push and see how far I could just create a painting that's all yellows, like nothing else, just yellows and yellows and yellows, just to see where that color could bring me and just so that's not really true either. But but it's still about the form within that and the, the textures and the matte areas. Uh, several years ago I would I uh, would varnish all my my work. So it had this uniform, juicy, kind of glossy appearance. And I haven't done that for many years because now I'm more interested in the uh, the the natural tendencies of different kinds of paints and different kinds of canvas. And so those speak through. So you can see chalk in there now, and you can see works that look like paints, certain paints types look matte, some look really shiny. Some, you know, just, just that variety that makes your eye move around more and sparkle more rather than just being like a you know a Jolly Rancher kind of candy look. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was really interested to know when you were talking about the assignment you were given about the brain and you didn't like that idea so you kind of took it in a different direction yeah. and you created something completely out of the box. I was kind of wondering, have you ever created something that was different and not what the original idea was and the client didn't end up liking it or maybe you had more questions about it? Um, well, not necessarily because um, um, okay, well, usually the way, and usually I, usually I don't do a lot of commission work because I'll have an exhibit, people will come, clients will come for that, unless it's something really big. The brain was for a fundraiser, so I wasn't too concerned about if they liked it or not. And, um, and they didn't. <laughs> Apparently they thought it really didn't look like enough like the brain. But, um, <laughs> I uh, I have never no I've never created something for a client and they've gone no that's that's not because I don't think I push it in those arenas so much I'll usually my creative process usually starts with what do I want to see in my home or what do I want to live with and that's where my real experimentation comes from and then usually people catch wind of those pieces or see them on my website or on Instagram or, and then that ball starts rolling. But, um, you know, we have a massive reject. <laughs> yeah, my, my mind's still boggling about the, like you did that really amazing creative thing with the idea of a brain and then they're like, well, oh, that doesn't look like a brain. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's science paper for you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, anybody over there? Got a question? Oh, yeah, good, thank you.
with the disintegration of the paintings and the, the change of focus, now I, I very rarely paint from reality. And I think it's because I've, I've painted them. At first I used to always say, well, you have to paint from reality because you're, you're, you're missing all, you know, like when I go into a kid's class and I say, okay, I always will bring in a fresh bouquet with for them. Because what they're gonna end up doing is they're gonna end up drawing a tulip that goes like this. Like this, don't, don't, don't. Because that's their idea of what it looks like, but it obviously doesn't look like that at all. So I'm trying to teach them how to look and to see the nuances and the differences and the weird little colors hidden in, in between. And that's what I was really teaching myself with the flowers at the beginning. And now that I feel like I kind of got that, um, now I have to almost let it go so that they don't become so representational. Because if I have them there, I'm going to just end up painting something. But, you know, flowers are historically so interesting. I have so many books with them where each flower has a different sentiment attached and um, different emotions, different historical meanings. Like, it's kind of endless subject matter. And then, you know, adding in my heritage to a certain degree. I think my, my next... Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to do this, but what I'm kind of interested in doing is going back and looking at some botanical paintings, flower paintings from the past, and recreating them in a contemporary version for myself and see where that takes me. I don't know. It feels... I'm not sure I'm going to do that. But it would be interesting as a different face and, and seeing how I could take that and push that uh, in a different <laughs> uh, I, oh yeah, go on then. We'll make, oh, go on then. Let's do these ones quite quick. Oh, everybody's putting their hand up now. It, once you think that it's the end, you know, put it with hand up. Okay. Over there, yes, please. You. Um, did you receive any backlash for not pursuing an arts, a fine arts degree? And if so, how did you deal with that? And if you did pursue an art uh, degree, do you think your career would have changed? That is such a good question, and it's such a big one for me. I think that in the painting world, in the art world, you have to be somebody's darling. So if you're going to university and you have a professor or you are taken under somebody's wings and they kind of discover you, it can be, and, or you go out to do a master's and maybe you get some grants and you, and you work in that system and you have a lot of mentors around you, I think it could be extremely beneficial. I kind of, what I was referencing earlier, backed myself into a little corner <coughs> because I was so independent. I don't really know other artists' friends. I wasn't really connected to the community. I had no mentors. And I was kind of popular with clients. So I had all these negatives against me. Plus I was painting florals, plus I was a female. So I kind of created a, a, a complicated box that I can't go back in time and change. Although for my older two daughters, I we've talked a lot about this. I've sent them to the most expensive programs with the most in influence so that, um, not, not that it's expensive, but I want them to come away with uh, a degree that has prestige and backing behind it. Because sometimes I feel like it's hard to to make a statement if you don't have that intellectual um, backing behind it. But who knows, I mean, everybody's got their own path. It really probably just comes down to fortitude and determination. Um, but I, yeah, it's a, it's a huge question. I Sometimes I super regret it, and sometimes I think it was brilliant. We're glad you took this path, so that's good. Uh, we'll be really quick on, yep. Which parts of the process do you like the least? <laughs> oh. And how do you deal with that? Oh. Anything computer based? <laughs> I, I don't like organizing websites, price lists. Um, sometimes the monotony in the middle of the day can be tiring, but you get over that pretty quickly. Um, I miss being at, at, at my studio is not at my house anymore. Um, I used to be in my home where I could interact with the kids and 
you know, I kind of miss that. I feel a little isolated. I feel like there's a little bit of isolation going on in my career right now. It's, and I've, I've heard that from other creatives that when they start out, the the hours and the, the solitude can get people down and they kind of drop off. Um, so that's something. But you do get into a swing. It gets quite normal to spend six or seven hours just standing and painting every day. But um, that's, that's, I, I would say anything technical is my problem. Sure. Um, money and computers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Did we have? What? Well, yeah. Last one. Yeah. What is either current or masters inspire you, or do you reference them often? Um, oh, yeah. Um, I have a few. They've changed over the years. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, yes, oh, oh, the question answer. was which artists am I influenced by and um, uh, or do I admire? And, Yes, they've changed radically over the years. I mean, I think I used to be more an impressionist and Monet style, you know, that, that even Van Gogh were way back at the beginning. And now I am, I really, there's a lot of female artists that I really enjoy, like Helen Frankenthaler for her, her ability to disdain and her big ideas. I love Joan Mitchell for her brushwork. Um, I love Pat Steer for her drips and her big movements. Um, uh, as far as local artists, I, I do really enjoy Gordon Smith's work. He has a wonderful way with patterning and layering up. Yeah, it's kind of, there's always seems to be, there's a lot of famous female artists that I'm particularly drawn to, and I feel like I'm taking little bits, not even intentionally from all of them, and incorporating them into my work to some degree, which if I dissected a piece, you could probably say this is what, you know, even though it's not conscious, I, I think that that's a Helen Frank terrible stain or something like that. Lovely. I think Maine's going to fetch you a little something. Whilst I say, I just wrote down one of the, the other amazing things that you said, which turned out to be loads of bits and they're all over this bit of paper. The thing about stick with something and doing it over and over and your voice will come through. That's a really powerful thought. It's a really powerful thought for all of us, I think. The thing yeah. of, the sort of thing, I know you had a phone conversation with Vane before and she was really struck by the thing, I'm talking on Vane's behalf now, but the thing about the, the daily grind of it, the just keeping going, to, yeah. and, then, and then good things come from just keeping going yeah, on it. That's a lot really of people think that, you know, beauty and creativity is, is like a relaxing thing yeah. to do, or a therapeutic. I think therapeutic it is. It does let you go into a different world, um, but relaxing it is not. And, uh, and it's tiring. It's just, it's exhausting mentally and physically. And uh, so, yeah, sticking with it, finding patterns that 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 let you push through. So I, I listen to a lot of podcasts during the day, and and uh, drink a lot of bubble water, and <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, they're so beautiful. We'd love to thank you for coming. That's all. We I've got to say thank you to Rain for helping organise this and thank you to Catalyst Stuff for setting up all of this stuff. Thank you to all of you for coming. But thank you especially, Bob. We hope you have a great time at Art Toronto on, the next, on this weekend. Hope to see some of you there. Yeah. Questions. And thank you for coming and doing it. Oh, she's talking about discounts. I'm trying to thank you. Thank you for this. This was great. Thank you so much.